Thank you, everyone. Um, hopefully you grabbed a coffee, a cup of tea, and we're ready to go for the next session. So this last session, again, um, really super insightful. We listened to it yesterday and um, just gained so much fantastic knowledge. Once again, we'll have all of these slides um, and information we'll pass on to you after today's event. So that's great. So I, I'm delighted to introduce the next section. Uh, we're going to be focusing on sustainability now. Um, and I'll soon be introducing Robbie Fitzpatrick from GEO Foundation, um, a, an organisation we've been doing a huge amount with over the last couple of years. Um, and one of our projects, which Dill will talk about, um, achieved Welsh Sports Sustainability Award of the Year, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Also, um, we have Paul Woodham from the RNA, again, an organisation leading the way in this area, so super excited. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dilwyn Griffiths, our Club Development, uh, Manager, uh, uh, Club Development Officer and Sustainability yeah. Manager for Wales Golf to um, just give a bit of insight into what we've been doing at Wales Golf and some of our, our future plans. Thanks, Dil. Thank you. Uh, Pnanda, everyone. Pnanda, I haven't had. Wasn't it Welsh good earlier? <laughs> the amount of voice messages we send is unbelievable. I practice. <laughs> she practices a lot. Right, um, thanks for the intro. So, uh, we're on the final topic of the day, and if you actually look at the strategy document on the tables, you'll find that sustainability sits right at the end there as well. Now, it sits at the end, not because it's an afterthought. Essentially, sustainability is almost a conclusion. It's almost the topic which binds everything we're looking at. Look, everything we're looking at delivering, it binds everything together. Um, just before I start, just to double-check you're all awake, I'm just going to ask you a quick question, and there's a prize involved in this. Does anyone, or who can tell me how many golf balls are on the moon? No, Han. <laughs> no cheating, Han. Three. Incorrect. I'm going to keep it. Nobody got it correct yesterday. <laughs> There's actually two golf balls on the moon. They were hit in 1971 by an astronaut <coughs> called Alan Shepard. He, the first shot, he stepped up. These videos, you can actually watch them on YouTube. He duffs the first one, hits the second one, and he calls into NASA, and he goes, this ball is going for miles and miles and miles and miles. And just like any other golfer we know, he was over-exaggerating. <laughs> it's now been proven those balls, that ball actually went about 40 yards. You can see the balls on the planet with a good telescope, apparently, um, and all the pictures of it are still there. There's actually also a ja javelin as well. One of the other astronauts got jealous, picked up a pole and threw it, and that landed 40 yards away next to the ball. So there we are, we're talking about the moon. Um, Wales Golf and Sustainability, our journey started at the tail end of 2021. Um, we were invited by Welsh Government to submit a proposal, which we did. Um, we were successful and we were awarded just over £100,000. Um, it was at that point we reached out to the GEO Foundation, who are the global leaders when it comes to sustainability, and we formed a strategic partnership. Um, we were also tasked by Welsh Government with taking the lead role in Wales in sport when it comes to sustainability. We were tasked with making sure that we drop it in, making sure that it's a topic that's Drop used in conversation when we're talking about sports. Um, and from the just over the £100,000 we got, we were able to actually run two club grant programmes in Wales, which saw us fund 27 sustainability projects across the country. Um, just to give you a taste of the types of projects we funded at Neath Golf Club, any of you know Neath well? When Neath was actually designed by James Braid, when he visited there, I think it was 1934, it was a heathland. Everywhere would have been purple. Um, it would have been absolutely stunning, in fact. Then, obviously, the 1960s came, the introduction of colour televisions. We started to see Augusta, possibly, for the first time, seeing these beautiful manicured green courses. Purple, we shouldn't have purple, it should be green. 
and that's what began happening. We slowly started phasing out things like Heather. Um, so at Neath, we funded the Heather Regeneration Project. Now, just to give you an idea, we were able to fund Neath to the tune of roughly about 2,500, if I remember rightly. Uh, when it comes to buying a Heather bag of seeds and mix, you don't get a lot for two and a half grand. You get two pallets worth, which is essentially about 25 square metres. So if you were to put that value on what the heather all over the course probably would have been valued at, it would have been millions, millions. So these are natural resources we have on our courses, which we really should cherish. Um, some of the projects we funded, Chandrindad Wells and St. Melid, we created wildflower meadows. Uh, James is nodding at me. James came up to film one of the wildflower meadows at St. Melid and got attacked by um, the local bees they have in their hives. <laughs> right in the neck. Um, the wildflower meadows at St. Melid, it's... It, it's really worth Googling to see if you can find any images. It went really hot over social media, Instagram, people just turning up for a selfie with the flowers. Um, it was featured in BBC weather forecasts. It's so good, the Royal Horticultural Society went to visit it this year. Um, and they looked at it as, for, as a Welsh in bloom project, which it couldn't really win because it's not a town. Um, but the chief judge of the Welsh Royal Horticultural Society commented that it's the best wildflower meadow he had ever seen in his life and it really is it's stunning. Uh, some other projects we funded was natural solutions to drainage, be that with trees, helping to clear ditches etc. And another project we looked at was um, Tembi Golf Club looking at the dune restoration there as well. But there was 27 projects all over Wales. Um, we also began dialogue with the RNA, with Bigger, the other home unions, Sport Wales, and other national governing bodies in Wales. Um, and the result of which being at the start of this year, as so we mentioned, we were awarded the WSA Best Sustainability Project for Wales. That was the first time that award had ever been granted as well. So um, it was a huge, proud night for us picking up the award on behalf of Wales and Welsh golf clubs. Uh, something we've worked on this year um, was a manshed project. Is anyone aware of manshed charity? Manshed charity was initially set up uh, to assist men with mental health, and they've actually got a group or a shed in most towns in Wales. So I'd be surprised if you wouldn't have a cluster locally. It's where men go to meet, to talk, get their problems out, but to build stuff, being a shed. Uh, they build birdhouses, benches, etc., and they rely totally heavy on donations of timber. Um, the charity itself is actually funded um, through selling the birdhouses, the benches, etc. Now, because it's always been a mental health charity, people with mental health can still build. Um, but since the onset of COVID and stuff, what the charity has found throughout Wales is it's no longer just mental health issues, it's young men with early onset dementia, etc. So the standard of what they're building is not quite good enough to sell anymore, which has a knock-on effect on the charity's income. So this year we wanted to help. Um, I reached out to DP World Tour just before the Seniors Open Championship at Porth Call. And basically I asked them, when the event finishes, have you got any wood you don't need? So they said, yeah, do you know, I think we might. So on the Monday after the Seniors Open, I was able to go on to site with the local Manshed group. And we were actually able to walk around with Arena, the, one, the company responsible for building the area. They were telling us, skip, 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 skip. All the wood that was destined for the skip, we managed to save. We filled a transit van, thousands of pounds worth of timber, and we were able to donate that to the Bridge End Squirrels Club, which is a manshed group. Uh, since then, we've actually been there delivering golf activity sessions as well. 
And it's something we're hoping to um, do something similar once the Ladies British Open is at Porth Call next year, but we're hoping to set up some sort of link with Manshed groups across Wales as well. Um, where are we? Club support. We've also, this year, we've submitted a paper to Welsh Government. Usually when we go to Government for money, we go to the Sports Department. Now, Wales has seven development goals as part of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And if you look at what Wales as a country is committed to, it's a prosperous Wales, a resilient Wales, a healthier Wales, a more equal Wales, a Wales of more cohesive communities, a Wales of vibrant culture, and that's where sports hits, and a globally responsible Wales. Golf hits all seven of Wales' development goals, so we have gone to Welsh Government with a paper highlighting how Wales and how golf in Wales can address all of the different goals. Um, that paper at the moment is doing the rounds within Welsh Government departments, and if successful, we will again be passing on any investment we have back out to Welsh golf clubs through our grant schemes. Um, just before I hand it over to our guests, who are far more important than me, um, don't know if anyone has an interest in reading into the State of Nature report. It was published in August. Anyone heard of it? Um, it was a report done for the whole of the UK, including Wales. And just to give you some stats, 18% or one in six species of animals in Wales are at risk of extinction. Welsh wildlife has decreased on average by 20% since 1994. And believe it or not, the UK is actually classified as one of the world's most nature depleted countries. Um, there's also a list compiled by the RSPB, and this is something I'd urge you all to do at your club. Um, the RSPB have created a list of birds of conservational concerns, so there's red, amber, green. Anyone got any idea how many species of birds we have in Wales? 220, of which 60 are threatened with extinction. Now, these 60 actually happen to live on golf courses. Greenfinches, swifts, house martins, cuckoos, tree sparrows, kestrels, rooks, curlews, lapwings and starlings are all on that red list and might not be here for our children and grandchildren to see. These are birds which occupy our courses. You're going to hear Paul from the RNA talk later about some big changes to legislation coming with pesticides. We need things like starlings. They are our natural pesticides. They are the ones that fly around picking off the crane flies for us. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over, first of all, to Robbie from GEO. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Wales Golf and Shanishin Golf Club for facilitating the discussion. I'm sure it'll be very... Um, inspiring and important around the future of golf in Wales and beyond. So I am Dr Robbie Fitzpatrick from GEO Foundation. Um, I work on our certification programme, um, which some of you may be aware of or hopefully will be aware of by the end of today. Um, I also do a lot of research and innovation projects and I'm sent backpacking to do workshops and education type things like this on occasion. So. Today, um, my talk's going to be split into two sections. The first is going to be 15, 20 minutes, um, just building on what Dill was saying around broader global sustainability trends, um, kind of political responses across the world and nationally in Wales, and then the role and relevance of golf um, in these sorts of sustainability transitions. Um, I will then hand over to Paul from the RNA who will do more specific um, threats and opportunities for golf, and then I'll come back in with the, the range of support mechanisms that are in place for golf, golf facilities looking to, to get involved. So just a really quick background on GEO. Um, we're an international not-for-profit um, and really help to advance sustainability in and through golf. 
Um, so that's working with goal facilities to implement sustainability practices and also engaging governments and in, in larger federations and things. Um, we have our on-course programme, which I'll explain to you more in our next talk, um, but that's essentially a platform to record data on sustainability. That could be water consumption, energy consumption, etc. And then through on-course, you can then work towards becoming certified sustainable. Um, and again, I'll explain that more in the next talk. Um, we have key partnerships and collaborations across golf, and um, that extends from kind of communications and media um, strategies through to developing sustainability frameworks um, with national federations. We work closely with r &A, different tours, um, Sky Sports as well on kind of communications through golf events and things. Um, and all our programmes um, are underpinned by key aspects of credibility within sustainability. Um, so our, our equal label sits alongside um, really established labels such as Fair Trade, and Forest for All Forever. So these are equal labels that are developed to the highest standards in rigour. Um, so golf's label stands up there as well. Okay, so big picture, I'm going to go big. Um, can't see any golf balls on this <laughs> on the moon, but essentially the roots of sustainability are, are in, developed from the environmental movement in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, and this picture was really at the forefront of that, and it really put human civilization in, into perspective. Um, it hammered home that we're really one community of life living on one planet with finite resources, and we really need to steward them as responsibly and sustainably as possible. Fast forward 60 years, and we now have the science of sustainability. Um, this is the preeminent paper that um, was published in Nature, which is a really prestigious journal. It was a team of scientists, and what they basically did was map planetary boundaries. Now, these are the, the key parameters that support life, um, human life on Earth. And as you'll see from the diagram there, we're now overstepping a number of those key thresholds um, and compromising not only the kind of health and vitality of our own lives, but the future. Um, and the lives of future generations. The key ones, um, climate change, that is driven predominantly through carbon emissions from the burning of fossil fuels, um, biosphere integrity, as Dill was saying, genetic diversity is reducing at an alarming rate. Um, biodiversity has declined around 65% from a 1970s baseline. So we've lost 65% of the biodiversity on Earth since the 1970s. Um, linked to that is land system change, so that's the conversion of natural areas into houses, roads and monocultures of grass is included in that as well. We're, we're re really reducing the resilience of our ecosystems. And then also relevant to golf is biogeochemical flows of phosphorus and nitrogen. So they're in, contained in fertilisers and things and they have kind of really harmful impacts on ecosystems and their ability to deliver ecosystem services that support life. The World Economic Forum um, identified 10 risks for human civilization over the next 10 years, and all, if not most, if not all of them, are environmentally related. Um, again, biodiversity loss, water crisis, extreme weather like floods and droughts, natural disasters, famine, infectious diseases. You could also argue that cyber attacks and weapons of mass destruction could stem from conflicts over access to land and resources as well. Just to illustrate what's happening, I'm sure you'll all be aware, I drove down on Sunday afternoon and parts of the West Midlands were really, really wet. Um, there was a lot of flooding and water lying around. Um, food and water scarcity, the southern hemisphere is becoming drier and hotter, less able to grow crops, less able to, to store water in, for public essentials. Loss of ecosystems, again, these underpin human life and our ability to live and thrive. Um, and as you'll see again, a quarter of all species are threatened with extinction and many species have already become extinct. And again, that's, that's driven by land conversion and climate change. Cost and availability of key resources. I'm sure a lot of golf courses will be facing or aware of that at the moment. Um, gas and fossil fuel prices are increasing and as well, um, the, the minerals and things that go into fertilizers. And that's as, as resources become scarce, their price increases, and that will only continue into the future as well. So 
what has been the response? A bit of theory, just before we delve into um, what national governments and industries and things are doing. In the 1970s, when sustainability emerged, it was conventionally thought that we could separate out the economy, the environment and society, and that we could just focus on economic interventions or we could just focus on technological interventions. But as that's progressed, the emphasis has shifted to integration and transdisciplinarity. So that's really recognising that the economy, society and the environment are tightly integrated and you can't just focus on one in isolation. So essentially the environment is the ultimate <coughs> limiting factor. Without the environment, we can't have businesses, we can't have industries, we can't have places to live and work. So what we need to do is protect and regenerate the environment in ways that actually strengthen our society, that make our economies more prosperous. So there's more emphasis on team teamwork. Um, so an example on a golf course would be when you're designing and building a new golf course, you're not just going to have the architect. You know, it might also be useful to have an ecologist. It might be useful to have a community developer or a community planner there so that we can start to design and build and manage golf courses in ways that have multiple benefits across society. This has now been in, this, the concept of in integration has now been institutionalised um, in kind of global frameworks. So the UN SDGs, um, they are based, of which most governments, as Dill was mentioned, the Welsh government as well, um, they are ingrained in these in legislation. So public bodies are now having to monitor and report progress on meeting these SDGs. And again, they're deeply interconnected goals. So how do we protect life on land while also ensuring good health and well-being? How do we ensure clean water and sanitation while also ensuring healthy life below water? So again, it's not just a case of picking and choosing certain goals. It's all about how we can integrate and de deliver co-benefits across that, that global framework. One of the ones that's very much a hot topic at the moment is carbon emissions and climate change, as I'm sure you'll all be aware. Um, and most countries across the world have now committed to reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2045. Um, and these are, again, things that are very much a part of legislation in the way that we monitor and record progress. As Dil was mentioning, the Welsh Government have committed to this, the SDGs um, through the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, and sustainable development is very much ingrained in how public bodies operate, how they budget, how they monitor and record progress. Um, so. That the, the concept of sustainability is very much filtering down throughout society now um, and it's something that we all have to engage with. In terms of technological responses to these kind of different, this new policy landscape, um, we're seeing more renewable energy generation. Um, the picture just in from the left there is the percentage consumption of renewable energy in Wales. As we can see, that's increasing year by year. Recycling rates, Wales is leading the way at the moment, and also nature-based solutions and rewilding are becoming more and more of a trend. Um, so that's, as Dill was saying, regenerating landscapes, getting more nature into, um, into the places that we play, into the places that we work and live. Consumer expectations are also evolving. Um, the younger generations are now demanding that the products they buy, the services that they use, are socially conscious and environmentally responsible. You can see that with movements like veganism or organic products and all the different eco-labels that I talked about earlier. Um, and it's, it's becoming more and more important to people. Um, sustainability is very much on trend now and it's important to engage um, to ensure um, healthy market demand for different products and services. And sport is also evolving in the sustainability landscape. We're seeing more and more professional players speaking out. Um, that was Rory McIlroy at a DP World Tour event um, commenting on how important the, um, he views the environment. Um, Suzanne Peterson is one of our sustainable golf champions at GEO um, and she openly talks about and works whenever she's organising events to ingrain sustainability into the, the operations and running of it. And there's also different frameworks and sustainability strategies that different sports are adopting, and that's anywhere from sailing and rugby, um, and as well as the, national, the International Olympic Committee as well. They have their own sustainability strategy. So it's very much ingrained in sport now. So essentially, 
what we're in is a decade of action. Um, everyone's now catching on to the sustainability movement. And as Nelson Mandela said, sport can have a really, really positive role to play. Sport cuts across national, religious, political boundaries. It's a place where we see the best of our humanity. We have fun, we have a purpose, we play, we laugh. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vehicle of human health and well-being. So golf can have a very important role to play in terms of, firstly, biodiversity and the land conversion that I was talking about earlier. Golf is played on around 38,000 courses in 209 countries, and if you add up all the area, it's about 6 million acres of land, and that's roughly equivalent to Belgium. Um, so golf, as a sport, stewards roughly the land area of a country, um, and this land can be densely, uh, green space and densely populated urban areas. Very importantly, and I don't think it's spoken about enough, is that golf is actually a financially viable way of supporting biodiversity and ecosystem services. As players, we pay to play around biodiverse features like ponds, trees, bushes, areas of gorse, areas of heather. And that's, we actually generate an economic model that supports that biodiversity. Um, and all those natural areas generate ecosystem services like carbon sequestration and storage, flood prevention, pollination, and things like that. And that's just some examples pulled from our highlights hub that I'll talk about later of how golf courses are evolving and so the sorts of things that they're doing. Next, and very importantly, golf is it's play, it's, it's fun, it's, it's an opportunity to relax and rejuvenate, and I think society really needs that at the moment. Um, it also provides nature connection. We, through golf, we understand the importance of landscapes, and it's an opportunity to get outside, get into the fresh air, away from towns and cities and roads and offices. Um, it's in, it supports inclusion and participation, provides purpose, and um, it's a fulfilling lifelong sport and livelihood for tens of millions of players. I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for golf, and I'm sure there's many people that owe the game a lot across the world. And communication and education like today. Um, we can popularise sustainability, just like Suzanne Peterson, Rory McElroy. Through golf, we can engage people across the world in sustainability um, through major championships, the Olympics and other professional tournaments. So in sum, I think there's very exciting frontiers opening up for golf in this space. We can have a really, really positive regenerative role to play. And with that, I'll hand over to Paul to talk about sustainable agronomy and specific threats and opportunities. Thank you, Robbie. Good afternoon, everyone. Your endurance is admirable. You shall all get a sustainability certificate later in the day. Uh, so, where are we going? So, for I know some of you in the room, and I always enjoy coming to South Wales, particularly uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Paul Wood, I'm, I'm Head of Agronomy for Europe at the RNA. I uh, started there in February this year. I've worked as a consultant uh, agronomist in the industry for 14 years or so, previous to that golf course and greenkeeping for far too many years and a short stint of trying to play the game on the amateur circuit way in a different lifetime now. Uh, so what's coming next uh, and what to do next? Uh, so firstly, a little bit about the RNA. Um, Everybody associates the RNA as the governing body of the game for everywhere outside of USA and Mexico. Uh, the championships we run, a little map I'll show you in a moment, uh, we lead by example. Uh, fundamentally though, we're here to make the game more accessible, appealing, inclusive, but to make sure it's thriving in 50 years from now. <coughs> and that is a challenge. Many this week have been thinking, are we going to survive the next six months with the weather that we've had um, recently. Um, uh, so again, the championships, there's 28 championships that the RNA manage and the sustainable agronomy services, which I work within, uh, is part of sustainable golf and it derived from the sustainable championship agronomy. For years we've provided agronomy support to the championships, make sure that their courses are prepped, make sure they're sustainable, make sure there's legacy, 
make sure there is a good tournament, and we still do that. However, the RNA is, understands the importance of, of the, 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 the governance, the leadership, thought leadership, and wants to make sure that the resources that we have and the expertise that we have is accessible to the grassroots game. So a consultancy service was developed, a sustainable agronomy service. It's a non-for-profit um, uh, venture, uh, which the, the funds are then proceeds come back into the game. The RNA is committed to spend investing 200 million over the next 10 years. Uh, unfortunately, not on individual products before projects before you say, I know what we could do with a new irrigation system. Uh, but it's on greenkeeper education, research programs such as Golf Course 2030, um, the Greening the Open, the Green Links initiatives, but also just developing golf worldwide as well. Uh, so I work, still predominantly work within uh, GB and I, working with golf clubs, doing a whole load of other things with the RNA as well, and also <coughs> creating an extension into Europe now. We've, within 157 uh, affiliate organizations, I think there's 37 in U Europe, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, so we work with them exactly uh, as we are in this country uh, to spread the message and to really assist golf clubs. <coughs> so we are here to raise standards in sustainable agronomy. We, we sit very closely alongside the Golf Course 2030 research projects and there's some couple of brochures on your, uh, on your tables, one I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but there's a whole world of information available. Check out the Golf Course 2030 website. Uh, practical guidance and really what we're delivering is to make sure that is sort of uh, enabled um, on the ground as well as a sort of day to day good husbandry of the golf course uh, and how we are going to protect golf with the impact of climate change, resource restrictions, legislation, public opinion. We've still got a lot of work to do on that uh, and the political and operational challenges. So I think uh, who's got the button to how do we get this video to work? Press it again. Press it again. OK. No? Somebody might have to try not to fuse the... <laughs> there we go. Well done. The great golf courses combine fantastic design, good conditioning, best practice management and a wonderful environment. It might be a subliminal thing to golfers, but it's intrinsic in terms of what makes great golf courses great. It is incumbent upon us as the governing body of the game of golf and as golfers to ensure that the environment as well as the golf course that it sits in are both maintained optimally and along best practice lines. Well said, Alistair Beggs. So I work alongside Alistair Beggs and colleagues Gordon Howard and Simon Watson team of four, providing sustainable agronomy services, and as I said, that's growing into Europe. Um, but it just captures it quite nicely. Our role as agronomists, my role as agronomist has changed so much over the last five years in particular, uh, that seems far too much of people trying to deal with problems um, without getting to the cause of the problem. And, you know, I think that's really what we're trying to you know, bring holistic management together and, you know, try and influence the clubs because you as stakeholders, decision makers, have got some important work to do within the club, um, particularly, for instance, tree management. God forbid you might have to take a few trees down. Uh, but if you've only got to look at your aerial of your golf course on Google Earth and you see how they're becoming consumed by trees over the last 20 years. Not all planted, just successional growth uh, and spread of trees. So really trying to influence change, positive change and positive improvement. Uh, we do so much through communication. Uh, 
leadership within clubs within the industry. We do a lot of write a lot of content for the industry. Again, a lot of it available on the on the websites and through industry publications and through federations and partners such as Wales Golf. Um, so again, any questions you ever want to ask, either come straight to us or or work with uh, Wales Golf and always point you in our direction, or we can point you in the right direction as well. Uh, we are trying to influence, uh, importantly, the uh, positive engagement with integrated turf management, and I'll go on to explain what integrated turf management is, uh, particularly with sort of non-pesticidal disease management, and why that's important, and why I'm going to completely bring the mood down in about three minutes um, with some news. Um, Grass species management, how we want to have the better grasses on a golf course to thrive if the environment is right and if the playing conditions are right. But to do that in a right way, the most affordable way, cost effective way, if it is going to bring success or if it isn't, we need to understand why. Water security is a big issue, I'm sure, dealing with too much of it and then times when you've got not enough of it. And you're right in that sort of sweet spot, I think, where for much of the year you do get violent rain, copious amounts of rain, but then you hit long periods of drought and you're thinking, where's the water going to come from? Uh, but when we've got too much rain, can of course drain. Where's the drainage going to? Is it staying on the golf course, affecting your playing areas? Is it going off the golf course, adding to off-site flood risk? and some responsibility back on the club. So we need to connect the dots on all of these things. And golf course, uh, ecology, biodiversity, and perf importantly, performance and presentation because everybody's here to play golf uh, at the right standards. So just a, a, a gallery of some common threats that we've seen. I didn't have to delve too far back into uh, the iPad photos to sort of pick these out. Um, top left, summer, summer drought, irrigation issues, heavy shade and consumption of, of golf courses by trees, particularly at sort of Champion. We want to lengthen a golf course. Let's shove the tee back. Wouldn't it be nice to play out to that corridor of tees, tree, trees around there? But we can't get grass to grow. The uh, negative impact of shade, particularly how that's going to be really important with how we can control disease because uh, we just need good light and airflow and there's a lot of uh, things in our way uh, times, so particularly southeast uh, facing uh, greens and tees. Coastal erosion, of course, is along South Wales which are affected by coastal erosion. Bunkers, golf course design, playability of bunkers, really important with, again, you know, a lot of courses starting on the road of bunker improvements or bunker master plans. Uh, my first challenge would be, how many bunkers can you lose? Um, we can bring the numbers down, make the designs a little better, get water diverting away from them. Why reduce the number of bunkers? We should have parkland golf courses make better use of the natural features or the features we can create, more runoffs, more areas where a little finesse shot can be played and still a challenge. But we know it's time, certainly with the rainforest, it's taking longer to repair bunkers. Uh, sand costs are going up. The sand availability is going down. So you know, we need to really think quite cleverly in the future and it does I shall get my soapbox out in a minute but it, it, it does annoy me a little bit where we can create some architects can do some, some great wonderful things and, and Braid and Mackenzie designs and Fowler and Simpson of the sort of 18, uh, 80s, 1900s the reality being I think those great architects of the past would probably be doing something quite different because we didn't have the volume of play demands on presentation and the weather challenges that we face today. So we need form and functionality are important. So again, this is what we have to try and influence. 
drainage performance, how we're going to cope in the, in the wet periods, and of course, disease management and pest management and weed management. Um, so a quick resume there, really, of whether extremes play their expectations increased, increased where at times of wet conditions, legislation, scrutiny by the public, seen as golf courses are potentially huge users of water, fertiliser, not necessarily the case. Uh, increasing cost staffing issues for certainty are, are, are problematic uh, and quality and availability of materials. So we do need to think ahead and typically when we work with golf clubs it's, okay, where are you, where do you want to get to, what are your challenges, what's your five-year plan, most of golf courses have got five-year plans, if you're ambitious you've got a ten-year plan. What I'm really saying to you now is, okay, what's your 30-year plan? Because we have got to think that far ahead. When we are just starting to design some works, do some works, um, reclaiming part of the golf course with rebalancing the vegetation, for instance, we've got to think ahead. We can't be asleep at the wheel for picture of there of worms. Every visit I do, somebody will say, what are we going to do about worms? Not a lot you can do about worms. You are not going to be putting products on the, that kill worms, intentionally or unintentionally, because that's an authorised application and it's illegal and most of these products are toxic to aquatic life. So I know two golf courses that just missed prosecution this year and yeah it was just a, a fertilizer soil conditioner product that was applied worms are dead at the service surface somebody takes a photograph gets outside of the golf club local news picks it up and you've got problems so and the book will stop with the, the, the club or the person applying the product um, so why do we need a coordinated approach to sustainable agronomy? We need to create and reclaim golf course environments which is going to conducive to be conducive for uh, allow integrated turf management practices to succeed, non-pesticidal disease management practices to succeed. Uh, so we speak a lot so in reports and, and, and editorials for, uh, for publications about microclimate conditions, the environments around your green or your tea, which is heavily shaded, tree root invasion, you haven't got enough space for traffic management, so you're getting wear and tear. Um, bunkers, again, issues, you've got a bunker and a tree right next to where uh, the bunker, whenever you, when have you ever seen good turf conditions when a tree is within five yards or three yards of a bunker. So we need to really think because how, how are we going to sort of accommodate traffic around a golf course? The expectations need to align with your, what is achievable, site limitations, resource limitations. I think all advice has always got to be achievable. Um, and we've got to narrow the gap between expectations, particularly routine play and competition play. It's quite fuzzy now, that area. Uh, and you see on TV, championships and by day four, the greens are sort of looking, still playing great, but looking as if they're certainly day four championship greens. Um, but in a way, I see golf clubs members clubs try and replicate, try and push those boundaries to because reality, if you tom competition play, you are stressing the turf. And you do that, but then you've got the members open a few days later, and then the invitation, um, and then the captain's day. So you just, you're just creating sort of waves of stress, waves of peaks, when really we should be looking at a little bit, you're always going to tweak it a little bit, but we should be looking a little bit more consistency and less 
less stress on the turf because we simply haven't got the products anymore that will get you out of jail and we're going to have less of them and this is why change is coming whether we like it or not Robbie Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg. <laughs> 2009 UN Climate Conference, whose speech appeared in a book I took on holiday. It's 100 great speeches that changed the world. Mine didn't make it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, some did up quite well. So change is coming, right? Legislation, new legislation is coming your way. I sound like Martin Lewis here. Um, I haven't got those answers, I'm afraid. Uh, so, uh, the Sustainable Reuse Regulations 2024, which replaces the Sustainable Use Directive 2009. Write it down, there is a test later on. Um, so, what does that mean for you? It's, it's, it really is how we use chemicals. It's EU legislation. When I say chemicals, sorry, pesticides. Herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, plant growth regulators, likely. So, the new legislation is based on public health and it is protecting the public from exposure to applied products, pesticides, uh, uh, intentionally sort of coming into contact or unintentionally coming into contact. The golf courses will be classed as sensitive area in the draft legislation. Um, because you are, it's in public space. You're a private members golf club, but you are public. Now, the draft proposal from the EU is a complete ban on pesticides in public space, sensitive areas. That includes golf courses. So, when is this voted on? It's voted on soon. One of the jobs I'm working with the RNA is part of the uh, working group negotiation uh, panel with the uh, European Commission. Um, all I can say is that there will likely be some, some give in it and some negotiation, uh, but it's not a guarantee. And the reality being the commitment has got to be a drastic reduction in the use of pesticides. What is a drastic reduction? Bearing in mind agriculture is committing to 50%, immunity turf has got to do way better than that. So we're looking at likely an 80% reduction. So difficult to answer in terms of what does that mean for you because, you know, where are, you know, there's, there's probably lack of industry information um, available to legislators over, you know, how are we using pesticides now. Um, but reality being, let's talk about disease, because everybody thinks about disease. I think weeds will be the bigger issue, but let's talk about disease. And if you have a club that is using sort of five, six applications of fungicide, particularly in a South Wales, parkland, shaded, tight, heavily used golf course, poor annual greens, uh, six applications, let's say that's going to become two. So, and it may well be, for instance, in Europe, we're you know, trying to negotiate a sort of toolkit for, for, for use. Medicine cabinet, call it what you want. And it's going to be for a specific disease in a specific, specific, specific location um, only. So to give you examples in Netherlands, uh, who sort of been through a sort of similar process in a way before things got terrible and they negotiated a bit, a bit of return of stuff but you know a herbicide application is only within to 20 percent of the area in playing lines so you'd be picking and choosing areas a fair way that would get treated or not so it, it doesn't sound great but it is where we are and we've known it's coming for a long long time we've known it's coming and we could argue that scandinavian countries have probably been the few countries that took it really seriously and maybe a little bit better prepared uh, inevitably, the question is, but we're not in the EU. Surely there are some benefits of Brexit. It'll be copy and paste legislation um, to come across. Uh, and even if it isn't, um, which it will be, but even if it isn't, 
it is going to be, by default, the products just aren't going to be manufactured, available, uh, and those which are going to be available are going to be so expensive. So we have to look towards non-pesticidal disease management to reduce the risk. Um, creating a sort of roadmap for the industry, there will be transition periods. My best guess, the stuff I can tell you and the stuff I can't tell you, my best guess at the moment will be we're looking at uh, implementation of 50% by reduction by 2025, 26, transition towards 70%, 27, um, and then 80%, sort of 28 to 30 uh, would be my best guess of how the change will come. It might be a little bit more leeway if we're still outside of Europe, but um, it'll say, it'll all, it'll all come across. So, the course environment and turf management needs to adapt and communication with stakeholders, with you, with the professionals, the greenkeepers, with the industry in general is paramount importance. So it's an early heads up at the moment. Um, but to give you an idea of actions which have, um, over various years, um, have, have put golf in a good position to negotiate. And, you know, I hear green keepers saying, oh, this is ridiculous, I can't do this, and the agrochemicals will fight and will push back. They won't. But, you know, it's, again, it's more politically driven than science driven. And I don't think we're going to find too many politicians that will say pesticides on a golf course are a really good thing. So it's, um, you know, we've got, we've got to sort of think of this and make that, make that commitment to a drastic reduction. But the actions which have been taken over some years now, human uh, and environmental protection, we work under legislation, we work under good practice. Uh, application of IPM or ITM, Integrated Pest Management, Integrated Turf Management. And on your table is this book. Um, the online version takes you to a whole load, uh, load more, more information and technical information for the course manager. Um, but it really should be, for, I know the course is in a room, it really should be your Bible of what you're going to be doing because it explains written for the stakeholder, the golf club, the committee, managers, <clears throat> and sets out what is going to have to be done. Um, so we, we, and probably golf is actually leading the way in integrated turf management within amenity turf. There is monitoring and reporting, good methods in place. Technology is advancing and grass uh, seed selection uh, and breeding has moved, come a long way and it will move again. But we have got to, if we can get the, the, the hardier, more resilient turf grasses in the right location, it needs the right environment, it needs the right management. That is really going to help you when we've got limited access to pesticides and potentially no access to pesticides. It's really going to help. Applied research is going on all the time with the agrochemical companies looking at non-pesticidal disease management strategies. And again, you know, research that the RNA is funding, working with bodies such as STURF, Scandinavian Turf uh, Research, STURF Environment Research Foundation. Um, there's a lot of practitioner education uh, goes on. Uh, we are using lower toxicity uh, active ingredients. Um, so the chemicals that we use now, uh, there's less loading into the soils. They're less effective than they used to be. Um, and my message to clubs is, look, we are going to see disease. And recently with, with anthrax nose disease, for instance, before I've gone onto the golf course, the greenkeepers or the club are going, oh, the disease. Get out there and you, do you know what? That's fine. Live with it. Bit of overseeding, bit of work, but we've got to. We're going to expect uh, these conditions to come in, and this is on the back, obviously, of a very long wet period. But if we sort of turf is stressed 
through the summer through the dry spots we're going to invite more issues as well so but the products we use are not effective as they used to be five years ago and they're not as effective as the ones ten years ago so you know we're seeing this change we've got to prioritize the playing surfaces for for treatments and we're getting better at that whether that be sort of mowing strategies for instance to save on fuel as well um, and targeted applications again better spray technology and there'll be more advancements in that and this is part of what the roadmap is looking toward to give the industry time because we're saying there's been good work with impact assessments saying look we, we can't really cope with a sort of 2024 cut off you're off but that is still a risk efficient irrigation and nutrition hands up everybody who's got really efficient irrigation um, you surprise me not really um, but you know we're going to have to be very good at that because we, we, we stress man you know st we, we encourage stress we're going to get more issues there is a lot of decision supporting tools that the greenkeepers course managers have access to um, and stakeholder collaboration we're in this together we've got a lot to I'm working a lot with Europe now we've got a lot to learn from Europe and even the folks across the pond who have arguably probably areas now have tighter water legislation than, than us and it's coming this is coming as well but they are looking to how we are dealing with this and thinking this is going to come their way as well so and look if we in the UK can't get this to work with arguably some of the best greenkeepers well-educated greenkeepers uh, in Europe and a quite a temperate climate compared to the ice damage and extreme heat that you can get through through north and central Western Europe uh, or the, uh, the drought and salinity poor water quality issues in southern Europe if we can't get this to work nobody can however we've got to get these foundational changes um, to the golf course to make it a better environment so it comes back down to this to ensure uh, golf surface playability uh, is managed with a drastic reduction in pesticide use. I can't reiterate that uh, more than it's on these slides and as I've discussed. So I've been talking about setting the right environment and changing the anatomy of the golf course. Is that going to mean you take some trees down? Yes, it is. Get over it. Um, it's got to be done responsibly. Um, in terms of compartmental management, uh, uh, mitigation work on sort of habitat, uh, wildlife, but we can create more of a biodiverse environment um, so it can be done responsibly and beneficially. A good example would be how we're going to manage teas a bit better. The teas of the future uh, would probably be wider than they are longer. My colleague was talking about the world handicapping system and good discussion. I asked you a question yesterday, uh, Gemma, about I'm seeing at a practitioner level, tea's knackered because you know the, 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 the plate's there and the, the marker never goes beyond the bar and we've, you know, we're already gone back as far as we can. Uh, but there's, a, there's a, perhaps a lack of clarity over the how you can be more imaginative, and I don't, you can probably answer this, sorry, I'm throwing you right in it here. No problem. But how you could be more imaginative, we were talking about switching teas on and off. Yeah, so there's, there's lots of things you can do, obviously, within, within a fixed, so your fixed measure in your tea box being in a central location. So if you've got a wide tee, don't have it two yards off the back because you've nowhere to go behind it. So making sure that they are giving you your 10 yards that you can move it forward and back so you've got a 20 yard disbursement that way. But also just being really clever in terms of within your technology system, within the, the software, you've got the ability to make teas live uh, on a daily basis. 
So, for example, you might not want to use your blue and your white tea um, during the winter months, and you don't want anybody to play on them and return scores. So, turn them off, get rid of the teas, let them let them recover. Or you could do it sort of like you're going to use the, red, the, the yellow tea for two days a week and the white tea for the other three days, and then your competition. So, just be a bit clever in terms of, of where your tea box, where your fixed measuring points are set up when you re-measure, and then try to balance them well by saying to players, the yellow teas is the only tea that's available today. If you want to put a score in, that's the one that you've got to use. I remember when golf was simple. Um, but you're absolutely right, and I think we see you know, committees, um, you know, the greenkeepers trying to make the best use of otherwise redundant tea areas, but then somebody's in the ear of the club and the instruction comes back, no, everything's got to be within, within five yards, let alone ten yards. Um, uh, so it's really difficult. We've got to get better at managing where around uh, our golf course. I did a presentation last week to Yorkshire Golf Union, which was fun. So sort of 12 or 14 angry Yorkshiremen. You know, I'll do what I like when I like. It's far easier. Um, greens drainage. I'll talk a little bit about that in, in, in a moment. But I gave a presentation at a conference in 2015, managing Parkland greens. And I said, hands up who's drained their greens in about a third of the room. Uh, held the hands up and I said, before we even start, you know, I think you need to drain your greens moving forward. Uh, and I haven't changed my mind from, from that and I know some of the clubs in the room are working on that and considering that. And we've only got this week, we're just seeing soil-based greens giving up the ghost under the pressure of the sustained wet conditions. If you can't get the water to drain quick enough that way, We've got to get it out via a drainage system. Uh, we are looking at creating a better vegetation balance on the golf course, making better habitats with managed grasslands where, where available, reduce trees responsibly. Uh, but let me linger on uh, drainage. And if we are looking at the better grasses, more resilient grasses. We need greens to drain well. If you can get better light and airflow to them, that's important to fairways as well in terms of worm cast management, but a bit of light and airflow to them, they, they will immediately be best, better. Good commitment to aeration practices. And the Scandinavians at a conference recently said, you know, the research that they are doing in non-pesticidal disease management to succeed, it's going to have to be um, uh, the, the greenkeeper is going to have much more sort of license and freedom to do what they want to do when they need to do it. So I'm not talking about holocaust in the greens tomorrow and announce when you've got an important society coming in, but you know there are there are things where again just just windows of opportunity are missed or delayed because of other reasons. So we've got to be much more on the ball. Uh, but good drainage is a basic a requirement, and certainly if we want bent grass to, to succeed as part of our blend. Um, as I say, soil-based greens, we do a lot of work on, it, on a, a evidence gathering, objective measurements, and, and just so presenting a case for drainage. Um, and yeah, these lower soils, these push-up soil greens now, the water just infiltrates and he just it's just that capacity all at a time and just re really struggling so uh, we need to think about we either aerate our way out of it or we've got to look at drainage um, and and that would be a common common profile of sort of a sand built up a hundred and hundred twenty five millimeters um, which it infiltrates relatively well apart from organic matter on the top and then hits these sort of interpacked heavier soils and it's just backing up and causing issues. Uh, but drainage is, needs investment and drainage is feared, unfortunately, sometimes because it's going to be so much disruption and we can't possibly be off the green for that long. But even traditional pipe drainage, you can get it in, you can get it 
back into play quickly. Um, the, these photographs uh, uh, here just sort of shows the process. It looks a lot of work. Um, be about a week to week to install, start to finish, uh, depending on how you're going about it. Um, but that, that green, for instance, there was back in play within two weeks. So uh, there's a bit of a misconception or other. There's new methods of drainage as well. A longevity of some might not be quite as good, but you know I think you'll always achieve improvement uh, by uh, adding drainage of the form that allow again your cultural management practices a chance to succeed. Uh, we also looking at water security issues in terms of have you got enough water for irrigation? Where is that water coming from? Hands up who's or st on mains water do you know? That's good, no hands up. Because uh, again, that's gonna, there is gonna be legislation more on that and the costs will be going up and up. Um, but we're working with clubs and so we've got a, uh, uh, working alongside the TEP, the Environment Partnership, to really look at these sort of sustainable abstraction or water harvesting opportunities and getting people again to join the dots between the drainage issues, drainage concerns that you've got and solutions to make sure that, okay, can we hold the water on the golf course so it's not discharging, uh, can we throttle it back so it's not rushing off site and causing issues, but then is that water available uh, for you to use? Or are there other areas such as grey water, wastewater reuse, uh, or industrial water off site? Can we take water off site and potentially be paid to take water off site. Um, so yeah, that could provide your solution. You could get paid towards that solution as well. So we're working alongside uh, people who know to, to see, okay, well, what is feasible? What's the direction? We add our weight behind it as well. When you start discussing with planners, legislators, etc. <clears throat> um, and why is this important? And Robbie's already set the scene for this, but some predictions on summer rainfall projections and uh, you can see by 2070 in South Wales there we're going to be sort of getting lower but we are going to get violent rain uh, a bit more frequent so it's not always usable for the turf it'll just come in a flash storm and run off and cause issues and damage uh, but the general trend is less water and then winter rainfall again as, as it, does, it seems a long way off but he says we are going to get less um, but, um, but yeah, the, the, just all the seasons have shifted, and we're just getting so much growth in the in the autumn periods now. Um, some weird things happening, but yeah, the climate is changing. We've got to change to adapt to uh, accommodate what's happening. Uh, so I say I've worked with with some in the room before. Range of support that we we offer to to clubs. As I say, everything is now just such big picture. I spend less time with the greenkeepers now. What fertilizer, what bag of fertilizer did you put on? And the industry is getting better from the early days of doing agronomy, and they say it was a white bag. Um, but but we, 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 we get, we're getting better, but there's, we are really, we're talking big picture and, and, and continued setting strategies, guiding with the strategies seeing how progress is made, keeping the stakeholders' interest, um, because we've got to deliver the surfaces as well. Um, so that's typically how we're working. As I say, there's a whole load of information the RNA provides uh, with Golf Course 2030 as well, but again with industry partners such as GEO, uh, as well as the, 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 the information, the thought leadership that is offered. Um, but I'm Please feel free to ask any questions. No question is as a silly question at all. Um, and if you think of something tonight as you go home, think, ah, should have asked, get in touch. Um, I've got some cards if anybody hasn't got my details, but if not, go through Wales Golf. Um, but thank you for your time and your patience. And I'm trying to get my head around, uh, and I have got my head around, oh my gosh, what on earth is going to happen to golf? This is horrendous. You actually, we've known it's coming. 
these are, there are opportunities. We've just got to be brave enough to create the environment and take these opportunities. And that starts with the hard work with your members. Thank you. Okay, back again. Um, promise this one's more positive and inspiring for you and more practical. What are you saying, Robbie? <laughs> <laughs> no, from my first presentation, I meant not yours. Not yours. <laughs> um, so, this one I'm going to focus on priorities and solutions. So, really getting to the grips with what does sustainability mean in golf and in agronomy and these sorts of things, and what support and recognition tools are available for you as golf facilities across the industry. So, what we at GEO do as a foundation is really make it easier to understand, deliver and talk about sustainability. It's a very complex, interconnected issue with all those different goals and all the different things that are associated with it. So what we've essentially done is split it into four key areas for golf. And that's fostering nature, conserving resources, strengthening communities and taking climate action. So essentially, within those priority areas, there are different action areas that we can take, and that includes a lot of the agronomy stuff that Paul was just talking about there. So the first one, fostering nature, is really about the landscape and the ecosystem. So understanding, protecting and enhancing the biodiversity and land in our care. So that's through things like including habitat and biodiversity onto the golf course, integrated tough grass management, again, around pesticides and fertilizers and things, and pollution prevention when handling um, chemicals and fertilizers and things. So on our highlights hub on sustainable.golf, the website, I'll go into it in a bit more detail in a minute, um, there's essentially thousands of examples um, of highlights and success stories from golf courses from around the world um, on these different action areas. So we see here, Golf Club is doing a rewilding project and saving diesel and money by regenerating and increasing the size and biodiversity of the non-plate areas. And there's plenty of other examples of how golf courses can do that. And I say it's not just a golf course problem this as well. It also extends to clubhouses and maintenance facilities. So that could include things like gardens around the golf um, around the clubhouse, maybe green green roofs and different things like that. Next one, conserving resources, three key areas, energy water and materials, particularly sand, which is becoming ever more scarce in the UK, especially. So again, plenty of highlights, projects and practices to re reduce resource consumption. There's tons of them I could talk to you about for probably a couple of hours on them. But they extend from anything as simple as changing your mowing patterns instead of doing crisscross and diamonds and things, just up and down. Um, raising your height or cut a wee bit, taking in your fairways by half a metre or so. And then this, again, maybe switching to electric machinery, precision irrigation systems, all these sorts of things um, add up in terms of resource savings and cost savings. And again, there's hundreds of examples on sustainable.golf of success stories of golf courses that are successfully reducing resources and money. Um, strengthening community. Um, so essentially that's around employment, out community outreach, communications, so how do you represent yourself as a golf club out in the community um, and beyond that to governments and things? Again, some examples, if we're going, and going back to that concept of integration, where if you're going to be maybe increasing the size and biodiversity of your non-play areas, there might be another, a little area there that you could use for an outdoor classroom and engage with local schools and things like that. Um, there's also, yeah, just, there's tons of different things from charity, um, through to um, fun runs, different things like that to get involved in the community if you're going to be diversifying how your golf course is designed and structured and things. And again, that extends beyond just the golf course. It could be the clubhouse, using the clubhouse for charity events, fundraisers, dances, parties, whatever it may be. Taking climate action, that weaves through the different priority areas in terms of nature, resources, um, so essentially what we're looking to do is reduce emissions, increase sequestration. So that could be through trees and natural areas that sequester and store carbon and incredibly mitigating unavoidable emissions. And we at GEO have a carbon mitigation program that can offset emissions that you can um, do it at the moment as a golf course. So again, this feeds through the golf course into the clubhouse and maintenance facilities, could include 
installing solar panels, it could include LED lighting in the clubhouse, um, could include sourcing food and drinks and things from local suppliers to reduce food miles. So again, there's hundreds of examples on sustainable.golf of the different ways that golf courses are evolving in this area. So essentially, sustainability, it's not just about the environment. It makes business sense. It makes sense for golf, the future of golf. Um, there's cost savings when you're reducing the amount of resources you use, you're going to save money. And a lot of the kind of high-tech technologies like precision irrigation systems, solar panels, electric mowers, they will pay off in the long term, even though they might incur an initial um, cost outlay. And again, if you're maybe taking in your fairways a bit, that could save money in terms of fuel and um, expenditure on diesel and things. I've played golf for about 20 years and I prefer very natural golf courses and I think there's probably an easy one there for golf where we could start to market and showcase the, the benefits for playability and playing experiences of more naturalistic um, styles of golf course. There's more shot value, there's more strategic interest in it for players perhaps, but again we need to make a balance between making it too difficult. Um, Again, if you're shouting about these things that you're doing, you're going to be recognised as a more valuable member of the community. You might get sponsorships and publicity, and it's also good for staff engagement and team building. There's, there's a lot of discussions around if we're going to be maintaining golf courses more sustainably, what does that mean for the future of greenkeeping? And there might be more career opportunities and education opportunities there to, um, to develop new skills and experiences. So essentially what sustainability is about, it's essentially about more efficient, resilient and popular golf facilities um, and higher asset values for us as a business and an industry. So what support and recognition is available? There's plenty of knowledge, ideas, support, insights, recognition and ways to get involved. And I'll run through each of these very quickly um, and just explain what's, what's there. As Paul was saying, there's Golf Course 2030. They've done a lot of kind of industry leading research, particularly around water and things. I know a lot of those studies are starting to be published on the RNA's website. We at GEO also have the Sustainable Golf Innovation Centre. Um, that's where all the highlights live. So again, there's a, thousands of examples of golf courses that are evolving across those different priority themes. I've also done a huge literature review and put all the latest science and things, scientific articles on there as well. Um, around things like water and energy and carbon and golf. This is the Highlights Hub. This picture moves, I learned that yesterday. Um, essentially, you can filter by topic. So if you're looking as a golf course, what are golf courses doing around energy efficiency? Um, can't actually read that, maybe need a pair of glasses. But essentially, you do that, and then there's all these highlights of, of case studies of how golf courses are evolving and taking action in that area. And that's all freely accessible. And you as golf courses are um, able to submit your own as well to share what you're doing. So it's really about that peer-to-peer -peer learning um, and from these sorts of case studies. What we're typically associated with is OnCourse. Now OnCourse is essentially a, a cloud-based database where you can record your energy consumption, your water consumption, all these different mm -hmm. metrics. So you can see the impacts that your sustainable agronomy might be having, your different clubhouse operations, um, and it essentially allows you to benchmark, monitor, and report out again to communities, to whoever it may be that's interested in that. So on course, essentially it's built and made up of data and practices. So you can submit annual data to the platform. Again, totally free to register. There's no cost involved in it at all. It's there for you. We're there to support you through this sustainability journey. When you go into the data, it's organised into nature, resources and community, you can record things like the total area of your turf grass, what kind of habitat you have in the golf course, and it really allows you to monitor and track your progress year on year. Again, resources, you can record where you get your energy from, all these sorts of things. It really allows you to understand if you're going to be making these changes, what impact is it actually having on these these performance, sustainability performance parameters across the golf course. On course, it also has a industry best practices for each of these priority areas, nature, resources, and community. These best practices were derived from stakeholder working groups. We renew them every five years. So it's essentially a database of industry best practice around sustainability. They all come with guidance boxes. When you click the guidance, it explains more about what the practice is and how that might have benefits for you. So it's again, 
the practices range from simple things like targeting your irrigation to key areas like greens and teas, um, through to more um, complex things like precision irrigation systems and things. Again, there's some community ones that you can tick off and it's a way to really record what you're doing as a golf course. When you do on course, we can then produce sustainability scorecards for you. And I, that's really a kind of clean, very presentable scorecard document of everything that you're doing for the environment and society. And again, it hits all those key metrics. What's your area of habitat? What kind of habitats? What kind of species do you have? All those sorts of things. That's how it looks. There's the resources section around water consumption and things. And we can do trendy data trended year-on-year -year analysis as well, where we record how much water you use in year-on-year, so you can see if you're trending down, if you're trending up, what impacts the projects and practices you're doing are actually having. And that's some more infographics that are contained within those scorecards. So it's a really good way to, to showcase and celebrate and shout about what you're doing as a golf facility. We can also do insights reports, so if there's management groups that maybe own eight or nine different golf courses, we can do a group report and really analyse how those golf courses as a, as a group um, are performing. And we can do national level reports um, where we would take the data from golf courses in one country and then we can send that or use, give them that to then report to their national government um, to then strengthen and showcase the value of golf. And when you join on course, again, totally free to sign up, you get added on to the Sustainable Golf Leaderboard, and that's essentially a profile page for you as a golf course. So you can get, your highlights will appear on there if you submit any highlights. Um, you'll appear on the, the map there where you can filter golf courses that are members of the platform and are actively engaging with sustainability. And then finally, what we're typically recognised for is a sustainability certification programme. So when you submit a full year of annual data on OnCourse and you tick off key best practices, you can then apply for sustainability certification that stands up against key equal labels like Fair Trade, Forest for All, Forever, Marine Stewardship Council and things like that. So they're all ICO code compliant and we work very, very hard year on year to, to ensure that our, our certificate and our certification programme aligns with those standards. There's also different ways of getting involved, that includes social media, um, we've got a Twitter page, Instagram, we have our Sustainable Golf Champions, like Suzanne Peterson, there's also a number of greenkeepers that have done really, really good things um, within for the golf industry. So we recognise um, progress and success when we see it. And we also have a monthly newsletter that you can sign up for as well. <coughs> And yeah, just to conclude then, um, I think we're within a decade of action where golf courses can play a very, very strong role. We at GEO have a set of programmes we like to call ourselves the caddy. We're not there to tell you what to do, but we're there to support you. We're there to whisper a bit of advice in your ear. And that's essentially what on course is there to do. It's, it's there for you as golf facilities um, to record, monitor your progress, and most importantly, to shout about it and tell everyone else what they're doing. Um, and yeah, thank you very, very much for having me. Uh, just to re-emphasise what Robbie spoke of there, on course, if I can urge you all to have a look, it's really not difficult. If you register your golf club, if you have done a sustainability project of any type, um, could be beehives on the course, upload a paragraph, upload a photo and you're on, you've begun your journey. Um, you can then set up possibly a working group to start working through uh, all of the other factors. But you've got to start somewhere and it's quite often the first steps, the hardest one to take. So let's start off quite easy, nice picture, nice paragraph, get on on course. Um, the document on the tables, has anyone had a good look through it? I urge you to grab one and take it back for your Greens Committee. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I'm well impressed with it. Um, also, if I can direct you, it's been mentioned by Paul, Golf Course 2030, quite a few documents on the RNA website. Um, back in 2019, the Home Unions 
big uh, the RNA got together and they actually looked at golf courses in 2030. They came up with three scenarios. First case scenario, membership levels stay the same, costs of energy stay the same, legislation changes, no changes. Scenario two, things changed a bit. And scenario three was slight decrease in membership, hell of a rise in energy costs, uh, flooding and drought. We got all of those last year in Wales. That was the worst case scenario for golf. So I don't think this year's been much better. So I'd urge you to have a look at the Golf Course 2030 document, but also if you have a look at Golf Course 2030 forward slash water, it's just full of really practical solutions for water. Uh, it'll highlight how much it would cost, if, is it expensive, and is it really hard to do. It goes into really fine detail, it's well worth a look. Um, something else for Robbie as well, um, I don't really watch much television, but I watch an awful lot of YouTube. The Geo's YouTube channel's got some really good insights, good interviews. During the GOC24 conference at Glasgow, there was a separate golf um, conference held looking at golf sustainability, and that's worth also having a look at. The video for that is on the YouTube page. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming ever such a long way as well, Robbie. Does anyone have any questions for Robbie or Paul? We have one. I don't really know who it's um, directed at, but a lot of what you guys spoke about costs a lot of money. Um, E-machines, precision irrigation, draining greens from scratch. You know, is there any funding out there to help us poor Welsh clubs with I wish there was, to be honest. Um, some of you might be aware Sport Wales launched an energy club this year. Any club supply for that? One, two, three, four. Uh, there was almost 40 applications received by Sport Wales from golf clubs, and they funded eight. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you, we went through each application, didn't we? Those eight didn't stand out. There, there was another 32 brilliant applications. We passed them all, didn't we? Yes. We have to approve before they go to Sport Wales, and we approved every single one, and they got knocked back by Sport Wales. All we can suggest is that you go again next time, because the grant is coming out, and it's eventually going to be your club's turn. That's all we can do. Well, I think I mean, energy, yeah, it's, it's out there as part of the Welsh Government same strands I said earlier, but it's a much harder convincer to dig up your green and put drains in there for some fun that, isn't it? But the water's going to be such an issue to you, if you can make the savings on water by going for the grant, it's going to be <coughs> or something else potentially to look at this avenue. Um, until funding does become available, as, as I said earlier, we have submitted quite a paper to Welsh Government. Um, Fingers crossed that's underspent in some departments because that's where the money's going to come to us from. Um, the funding normally will go to Sport Wales. Sport Wales <coughs> distribute it through their normal avenues. We have been cheeky. We have been really cheeky. Um, I think the highest amount we've asked for is about 300,000, pushing towards the half, which we would probably be asking for next time. And we have taken into account what you need. Uh, we've actually taken into account what the clean keepers need as well. Um, just to give you an idea, I've got one golf course that spent £1,500 a year on peanuts. Any idea why? Badgers. Badgers. It's to keep the badger in the wood. These are all little things you don't really know until you speak to the clean keepers. I spoke to the clean keeper at that club, that works, and by the way, I asked the clean keeper, if you had a little fun, you could have whatever you want, what would you have? And he thought, ooh, a solar powered wireless trail camera so I, so I know when these badges are coming out. And it's the type of thing he cannot go to his management committee and ask for a £500 camera. He doesn't feel like he can, but he should be able to. But we've taken that into account and put that into our paper to Sport Wales as well. 
Um, so as I say, Dave's nuts, just down the road at Mold Golf Club, Colin the Greenkeeper there uses his own urine. He's out on the coast, weeing on trees. This is his excuse. <laughs> <laughs> but he is out there weeing on some of the trees to try and keep the badgers in. Uh, scarecrow sequence as well. Um, he said all things that happen, we need to be talking, we need to be singing the good practices that we do. So that's where our hope of getting money will eventually come from. Robbie? I, don't, yeah. I think as well that I see in golf that there's this perception that sustainability is about the high tech stuff, the precision irrigation systems, the, the kind of drainage overhaul and things, and those things are important. But a lot of sustainability solutions are about the low tech, nature based solutions where it's about encouraging more biodiversity on your golf course, it's about less management, less maintenance. And I think the biggest barrier there is probably going to be the golfer, and it comes back to what Paul was saying about putting up with some daisies or maybe there's a weed or two. So I think there's, there's a real barrier there in terms of playing expectations and what we're going, the kind of standard of golf course that we're going to be playing in the future. But I think I would say that a lot of sustainability solutions are actually nature-based and could save money in the long term, but I also understand that there are water issues and things that you require over the high tech type stuff. Robbie, just one thing. If it's, are you, like, a lot of us float, have a, uh, we all run an old machinery, diesel machinery, sorry, I couldn't think, I was just, couldn't think of Russell's name, which is a first. Feasibility and many clubs go running all the we're going to be running all the kit for the foreseeable future. Won't be able to afford electric. Going biodiesel and stuff. You seen is a switch with that? Yeah, we have. I've seen some golf courses on the program. Um, yeah, an uptick in biodiesel and things like that. Um, it's definitely there. But again, it's it's about shouting about it, and I don't yeah. think enough clubs do that. So what we're really trying to do is get the case studies in place, and that's how we use our highlights hub on the course. Okay. There are examples of that on there, um, but we're just trying to. We're making a real concerted effort to get golf courses to share and shout, yeah. which I don't think we're really that. So that going forward, actually. it's going to have to be certain. Okay. We're all put it after. Yeah. We're going to have to be able to go to electric or anything. You know, mm -hmm. We're going to be able to afford that at the yeah. present moment in time. Plus, the way machines are going to grow all for about two years in advance as well. I think I'd just add, Russell, that uh, you know, my experience, you there are some many big ticket items, you're quite right, uh, that, that need to be addressed moving forward. But there is just a lack of a strategy in many clubs, um, and and pri then prioritising, you know what's the low hanging fruit, what can be done at, at low cost, what is the immediate sort of investment needed in a certain area, and and again in just in terms of maintenance budgets, applications and operations, I'm seeing money fly out the window on product-based solutions, which, I'm sorry, if it makes you feel good, great, but it ain't gonna make a difference. So, you know, really got to sort of get to the nuts and bolts of, of what's going on and what you can do, your time is available, what, what budget is available, and make sure it's going into the right areas. Um, and then, you know, what, what other work can be done uh, uh, around. And again, you agree, staffing resources is a, is a, is a big issue and but, you know, and, and weekend work is part of greenkeeping. And yes, for some, I'm seeing social media pictures of full crew in Saturday for this and hand cut this and this. And I'm thinking, well, why? Why are you making life so hard for yourself? Do you really need to do all of this work? <clears throat> so, you know, I really do think it needs a sort of, okay, what are we doing at the moment? What is going to be our forward strategy? What are our priorities for investments, and, and just how are we spending our money wisely at the moment? So I, I really just do think it needs a look. Paul, well, you said about looking at golf or, or the industry in say 30 years' time. Um, it's so difficult to see where, well, potentially where clubs are going to be next year. Um, mm -hmm. How do you begin that? How do you begin thinking of even 10 years down the line, 20 years, 30 years? How, how do you see it in 2050? 2050. I mean, first is understand more about the site that you, you've got mm -hmm. and how that site has perhaps changed over the previous yeah. 30 years. And you'll see, a, you'll see many positives, but in terms of the, the, the climate and how the golf course is used, 
And it's not sustainable for me to say, actually, in 30 years' time, you need 30% less golfers you know, your business and your operate. But you, you've got to think about how the golf course is being used and how you can reclaim parts of that golf course and then just manage traffic and manage expectations uh, differently. You know, we have got to have a recalibration of, of that. Um, so, you know, I, I, think we, I think we will see a shift in how the game is played and, and certainly on park and golf courses in, in 30 years from now, for sure. Um, technology will advance. We will have autonomous mowing. It's now just about feasible in, in, and people are starting to practice it. But that technology will really advance and I think the, the greenkeeping crew of the future, and granted, you know, where system equipment comes in, is going to be very expensive, but it'll come to us all eventually. But you know, they'll be setting a mower across a green, probably keeping sort of sight of it, whilst they're changing a hole or raking a bunker, or you'll have an autonomous sort of small, very small bunker rake going in. Um, so I think all of that stuff will come to us. Um, does that mean you'll downsize your team? Um, Probably not, but the sort of the, the green people will be much more in touch with the turf, uh, and again the turf health, and that's where what's what's important. Yeah, I think on that as well. It's there's a lot of talk when I've done my research around if green keepers are going to have more time, then they become more environmental managers mm -hmm. of the entire landscape, and there's more to be done there around biodiversity and outreach type projects as well. So it's an interesting point around the autonomous machinery as well. And I would say just on the kind of managing expectations and things. I think this is where it becomes beyond just a greenkeeping problem. And that's where we need golf course managers, committees, staff at the golf club to really buy into it. Mm. Because there needs to be that messaging around the parameters of the game are going to shift. The playability of the golf course is going to change and that kind of communication is vital um, throughout the golf facility and not just from a, an agronomic greenkeeping perspective. So I've got Paul, sorry, my ignorance and maybe a stupid question, but are you seeing any success? You know when you sort of have like diseases in the green, you know, obviously what we do is we top dress or whatever and we try and get the bed grass in or whatever it's going to be, a couple of million or so. Have you, have, is there anyone sort of doing, so when you have specific just targeted bent grass in specific areas just to see if it can you know, take over some of these diseased areas and things? It's a really good question and even at the the best of courses with the greatest the best environment for these grasses i'm now asking the question okay you're buying your seed but actually do you know what cultivars are working best for you mm. we buy based on research and sort of you know grass seed rankings and things like that but we never really set the time aside to to try it. okay well i'm going to keep my eye on on that i'm going to sow a patch in a piece of a chipping green or something like that or yeah. Uh, or, or tea management, okay, the grass I'm buying there, I'm, am I getting the best out of it, I'm doing the right thing there. We're just running at 100 mile an hour buying convenience fast food products, mm. because that's life these days. Yeah. And it's, um, but we're not stopping and thinking, um, is that having a benefit? Or am I simply just, I haven't got the environment yet? Yeah. What do I need to do? It's just so expensive, the bed seed could be better. It, absolutely, and people are going, you know, with bed seed, ah, oh, right, I'm going, I'm, I'm overseeding everything, but actually, is it the, the central sections, the highway sections of the greens that we need to be focusing on a little bit more? Yeah. Or um, So, you know, all of those things, we just need to be quite sort of smart. Um, and, you know, grass seed is getting expensive, and we're going to spend more money on it, but then, you know, I think within our maintenance budget, you could be, but, okay, but do you really need to spend on this or that? Yeah, yeah. Why are you buying that? Because it sort of was, you know, technical representative, so it showed me good testimony. Well, whenever you heard bad testimony? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, you know, I mean, I'm trying to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's some really good support, advice, <laughs> and really good products, and there's a whole load of chaff as well. Mm. Well then, just to touch quickly on your point, it's, it's uh, difficult to predict where we're going to be in 30 years. There's one thing we know of where we're going to be in 30 years. Has anyone heard of a town or a small village called Fairborn? It's located between Royal St. David's and Abel Anyone heard of it? 
Yeah. So that village is the first village that Welsh government has given up on. It's gone. It's gone to go. You can't buy a house in Fairbourne. People who live in Fairbourne, their homes are going to be under the sea. That they will be doing no work to hold the sea back at all in Fairbourne. Now that's going to occur elsewhere. It surely is. Uh, there's really good flood mapping solutions and software you can have a look at. Um, I grew up in Carnarvon. Anyone played the Carnarvon Golf Club? You have. Do you know the lovely drive underneath the castle along yes, the sea? Yes. Council aren't really maintaining that road anymore. So the golf course at Carnarvon is going to be there in 30 years, but you can't get to the golf course. That's the type of thing Carnarvon Golf Club needs to be looking at, going to the council, looking at potentially other routes in. That's what we can do. These are the type of actions because it's quite predictable. The sea's only coming one way. If the council are maintaining, it's going to wash away the roads. So we can almost predict, but we need to look. We need to start looking to be able to predict. Right, that's it from us. I'm going to hand this over to Zoe for we've got two minutes or so, two and we're bang on time. No, we're doing so well. A round of applause for Robbie. For interesting thank you so much so i've got just a, a few closing remarks and some thoughts from today and i've got a one minute task for you guys but just taking ourselves back from to the start of the day so we started off with citation and how did really interesting to hear about the changes in terms of hr and health and safety and the laws coming in something to be mindful of and for you guys as clubs to keep on top of those sorts of things there are the solutions there are the support networks out there um, and they'll take away the stress of doing that um, in terms of Howden's, making sure that your club is correctly uh, valued. When was it last valued? And if it is within the last 24 months, great, but actually we know that uh, that can change quite quickly. So overarching statement that change is coming, um, we've seen threaded throughout today's uh, presentations. Alistair at the NGCAA was talking about making sure we've got separate disciplinary processes and policies to your main articles or rules, so something to go away and check um, and avoiding um, any, any problems there and having clear processes to avoid those mistakes when it comes to discipline, uh, disciplinary. Um, Gemma at the RNA talking about you know the changes that are coming in the new year and, and definitely from April onwards but however there's so much support tons of supporting resources we at Wales Golf will be working closely with Gemma and the RNA team to make sure that you guys get all that information and you can pass that on to the golfers and then our last uh, session around uh, sustainability um, so much innovation going on out there but let's all work together as clubs and as associations to really support each other and, and share all that great information and finding out what works for one club might support you um, in another club. But again, change is coming, we can't stop that, so we've got to be part of that solution going forwards. So a huge thank you for you committing to your uh, full day of, of education today. Um, lots and lots of information to go away with. What I'd ask of you, just for one minute, is to just write down two or three key um, actions that you're going to take away and do today. And then I'm just going to invite anyone if they'd like to just kind of stick their hand up and, and say what they'll be. So take one minute, what are you going to go away with from today and an action back at your club? Whether it be a conversation, something physically to check, um, something you're going to apply for.